everybody. Thank you for joining this afternoon's panel, which is Stories from the Front Line, Filipino-owned restaurants in 2020. I'm going to be joined by a couple of guests, which I'm going to bring in in just a moment, but I did want to just paint kind of a background on where we've been in the past several months with the everything happening with the economy, with the pandemic, with social unrest, and of course, the upcoming election. With one in 10 restaurants having already closed today and a, a big fear of another fall wave beginning, the conversations about how people have done and what to do next are actually becoming more and more important. This obviously is not a short-lived thing. It's gonna be with us for a while. And I think we can all agree that 2020 has been just sucker punch after sucker punch, especially for those in the restaurant industry. So for these unsung heroes, we have a few guests joining us and starting from San Francisco, I'd like to bring in Deanna Sison. And Deanna is the owner and visionary behind Mestiza and Victory Hall and Little Skillet in San Francisco. Um, so uh, Deanna, welcome, you've been busy. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, I've been a little bit busy. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? Yeah. Uh, next, next up, uh, coming from the Eastern time zone in New York, uh, Uncle Harold or Chef Harold Villarosa. And he mm -hmm. has this, um, this great uh, comedy restaurant club called The Stand. Have not been able to be there. And unfortunately, my trip's going to be delayed <laughs> for a little yeah. bit longer. Um, but thank you thank so you much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, next, um, we have a West Coaster, AC Boral, who kind of splits his time between Southern California and Northern California. And um, I remember him most for his Longanisa Scotch eggs yeah. at his Rice and Shine brunch. And um, AC, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me, PJ. And um, I, I understand that uh, that there was an electrical fire that recently yeah. did some <laughs> Dang, yeah. 2020. Yeah. It's, it's like you said, sucker punch after sucker punch, but sucker we're still punch. here. Still here, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, finally, joining us from Oakland is Donna Insko. Uh, Donna is actually the founder and owner of one of our sponsors here today at 7th West. Uh, this is a really unique restaurant and bar venue and was um, one of the first to be able to pivot, but was prevented because of the complications in the city of Oakland and in Alameda County. So each of you have a very, very unique story. And um, now that we're all together, I want to ask the first question. And I wanna start with uh, Chef Harold, Uncle Harold. Mm -hmm. um, this is about your pivot. When the pandemic began, how was the first couple of weeks, couple of months? When did it set in that this is going to be a long haul? Well, I mean, in New York, it was really hard for uh, for us to really uh, gain a understanding of the magnitude of the, the pandemic. And what happened in the first month really was uh, some personal stuff. We, as chefs, we really, you know, kind of tucked into a room and and, 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 and really thought about What's the future for my for for the for the industry? And I think what happened was that you know we 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 kind of understood that the mental health and kind of the pressures of running a restaurant really put a toll on all of us. And this was somewhat of a, a, a mandatory uh, vacation time. So you know, for most of us, especially you know the head chefs of restaurants, you know, we got together and you know we just started to you know to really brainstorm on what's next and. For most of us that's been working chefs, you know, it's been hard to, you know, not be in a restaurant, work with a team and and then kind of do the things we do daily. So, you know, for the first few weeks, we were kind of lost. But I think now coming out of it six months to eight months uh, into the pandemic, uh, we kind of understand the marketplace. Uh, the rent is becoming a lot cheaper in New York. So if any of you East West Coasters want to come out to New York City, it's only like twenty five hundred. For a for a uh, for a restaurant right now, turnkey 900 square foot is ready to go. You can just come in and pop in and you do your thing. So you know it's it's a lot of those things that are happening. You know restaurants that are big are closing. You know a lot of the staff are looking for work. So there's really a lot of opportunity coming out of this uh, pandemic. And I think if you really know how to maneuver right, and if you know how to hustle properly, you can really come up on top here in 2021 coming up. 
Thank you. Uh, we're going to get back to what some of those maneuvers are um, in a little bit. Um, and it, it's interesting because like, like New York was ground zero for, for a lot of us on the West coast. I think um, like in the early kind of days, it seemed like what was happening there was fast approaching us. Yeah. And it didn't quite materialize like that. New York still was kind of hit the hardest. Um, once, what, what was that fear like knowing that, that was, that New York was ground zero? I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it hit hard for me because the restaurant that, you know, I put money into and kind of opened up, you know, it closed, you know what I mean? My team had to get displaced and, you know, people, you know, couldn't feed their family for, you know, for a few months already now. And so that was, you know, close to me. We lost, we lost the restaurant and, you know, they opened back up, but I, I you know, they can't afford my salary anymore. So, you know, I'm out in the streets too, unemployment. So, and then I think most of the chefs that were, you know, in the leadership role, we all finally realized that, you know, th that role as a chef is kind of gone for a while now. Like that, that chef owner relationship has gone for a while now. And, and I think we're looking towards becoming chef owners now instead of having that dynamic of a chef and owner situation. That, that is interesting. So kind of like a con further condensing of the roles. Yeah. Bare bones really to tell you the truth. As if you weren't busy enough. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, um, uh, let's head over to the to the West Coast. Um, AC. Uh, CSIG. I love it. I was wondering what everyone was going to be wearing to this. <laughs> uh, AC, tell us about your experience in the first few weeks and months. Yeah. So, um, I mean, our restaurant was uh, really new, actually. We actually had our grand opening in January. Got a review in the LA Times. Like, things were feeling really good. Um, but around that time, honestly, I already was kind of following the news about COVID across the globe um, and was like not feeling too great about what was going to happen in the future. So I'd like to say that I started the thought of pivoting back in December when I first heard about the idea of a global pandemic. You just didn't really know what was going to happen. And being a chef owner, like um, I really had to take into account everything. And so, you know, that was something that I started thinking about. and. By the time March rolled around, like I kind of processed like what might ha what might happen, um, and kind of already had like a game plan. And um, for me to kind of keep my spirits up and keep my motivation going is I had to shift my mindset from like um, thinking about the bottom line and then think and and I pivoted basically to thinking about how can I be of service to the community. And that was kind of the big move that I made. Um, it wasn't the most uh, lucrative way to go. But I kind of just had faith. I'm like, you know what? Like, if I'm going to be losing money, I'd rather be losing money and, and helping out my community. So we started feeding frontliners. We started donating meals to the community. Um, and this is alongside running our uh, our kind of like growing takeout and delivery service. So, um, yeah, and, and we ran that for a while. And we, we actually, it ended up being really good for us because we made a lot of connections within the community, within local government, um, and, and, you know, kind of just... Um, actually just like shifting our entire identity to a uh, to a social enterprise. And actually like, we are actually gonna be closed for business for a long while because of the fire. But uh, when we come back, we're, we're hoping to have, um, to be designated as a 501c3 by the time we came back. So um, yeah, I'm shifting into that. <laughs> I didn't know, I thought I was gonna be a restaurant owner chef, but you know, I'm gonna end up running a nonprofit instead, but that's cool, I'm happy with it. I, it, it's it's interesting that you say you're feeding the front lines, front front line workers, and I mean, who's feeding you? Because you're also oh, that's a, <laughs> let's not that's let's not good. forget that. Let's not forget that. Um, uh, food workers are often um, just kind of underappreciated. Let's put it that way. And 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 I think in the past, unless you had some type of special gimmick to get out of the the clutter, because I think we can all agree that we were probably over restauranted coming into the pandemic. Um, and, and there's an opportunity there that I want to discuss too. Uh, but now we have kind of refocused the, the importance and meaning into the food and those that make it. And, and I think that's definitely made a big difference. Um, on that point, um, AC, you, you mentioned a, a fire that was inside the kitchen here in California. Um, we have had the world's largest barbecue going on for about 60 days. Uh, 
I, I think I, I, a lot of people were really excited to go outside and then here comes all this smoke. So uh, uh, Deanna, I wanna uh, pitch this one to you. Um, how was your experience um, you know, early on in the pandemic? And then also what was it like adjusting recently with the wildfires? Uh, uh, where do I begin? Um, I think that um, those first few weeks of uh, when the pandemic hit was maybe some of the hardest in my life. Um, the hospitality industry, um, just as everyone has known, it has been one of the hardest hit. Um, if running a restaurant was hard before, I mean, it seems near impossible to do it after. <laughs> but before I talk about how we pivoted, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge how the pandemic made me personally question everything about my career choices <laughs> and also the future of the restaurant restaurant industry in general. Um, like Chef Harold had said, you know, this was almost like a forced um, time off where we actually got to sit with our thoughts and think about how we're going to evolve and how the restaurant industry is going to look in the future. Um, and I, I find myself, I found myself in food entrepreneurship, like many of the other panelists, which is for the love of food first, community second. We're not really motivated by the bottom line or just a money-making um, uh, thing. Uh, you know, what motivates, what motivates us really is uh, the interaction with the folks in our kitchen, with our customers, with our guests and our staff. And uh, owning a restaurant is really like a lifestyle choice more than anything. So when something like COVID hits, um, it's really not just about the bottom line. It's about everything. Your life, as you know, it is just completely gone overnight, literally. So from a business perspective, when you're operating on super slim margins to begin with, there really can't be any missteps along the way. So if you don't have that income for a day, that's bad. But if you don't have it for tomorrow or in two weeks or in two months or in three months, I mean, it's literally disastrous. So for me, having uh, three businesses, two fast casual operations and one bar, um, it was a lot of soul searching and a lot of thinking and a lot of just challenging my intellect <laughs> in my capacity to figure out what we were going to do. Um, so we went from 30 employees across the three businesses down to three, um, uh, super sad, you know, my staff, um, like the other panelists said, a lot of them didn't have access to unemployment. So we tried to set up some GoFundMe accounts to raise money, to help them for the, at least through those first several weeks. Um, and then once we were able to process those initial stages of shock, like everybody else, we just started applying for all the loans that we could, which is also a really complicated and not easy process. Um, at Little Skillet, we started doing meal kits um, pretty early on and family meal boxes, that kind of thing. Um, at the bar at Victory Hall, we just emptied all our inventory from our liquor closets and the shelves and set it up like a store and opened up a bottle shop uh, once in or twice a week. Um, at Mestiza, we, we shut down completely to the public. We didn't do takeout or delivery and we just used it as basically a commissary kitchen and also like um, AC, we, we tried to engage in a lot of relationships with the government and feeding um, folks on the front line and people uh, with food insecurities. So uh, yeah, and this week um, I'm, I'm about to open up a cloud kitchen for Little Skillet um, in the East Bay, just trying to open up more markets for myself and trying to get my income back to where, where it was before um, and trying different models. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just like an, an endless barrage, <laughs> um, gut punches everywhere, you know, like, um, AC, I, I've also dealt with an electrical fire recently. Um, I've had two break-ins, I've had a gas leak. I just like, you name it, like just craziness. So, uh, needless to say, I'm just like trying to stay even keel and being very deliberate and cautious about my next steps. Um, we're gonna take it easy for now. And just, uh, if we're breaking even, we're doing well. <laughs> so, and I, I keep a couple of people employed, including myself, I think we're doing okay. So beyond that, I think it's just a waiting game. Yeah, and the fires, back to your question. Sorry, I kind of digressed a bit, but back to the fires. Uh, yeah, you know, it's when, just as soon as we're, we're getting into the groove of outdoor dining and then the fires hit, you know, that's another thing. So you 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 start to have hope about a source of income and being able to slowly scale up again and then something like the fires which 
is really devastating. But you start to think about, you know, what's more meaningful is that there's so many people that are suffering in this state right now. So, uh, you know, more than just like focusing our, on our businesses, I think that it's been a, a more, uh, more of an opportunity to find meaning other, th other than through our businesses. So I'm really happy to, to hear that AC is pivoting to nonprofit world. I think that's really excellent. But that is a very, very interesting path. And I do want to get back to that a little bit. I've got like a list of uh, maneuvers, like our Uncle Harold had said. So I'm going to go over that list in a little bit. Uh, Donna, of everything that we've described, I've just heard kind of through the grapevine that you hit maybe more roadblocks than most. Yeah, unfortunately, um, you know, we... It, it, it did take us quite a while to uh, get back ramped up. Um, and, you know, when when COVID hit, it was a complete and utter stop. Um, you know, similar to everybody else here, you know, we, start, we had 25 employees and unfortunately we had to let everybody go. Um, in addition to that, you know, we were not actually operating our own kitchen. We um, were creating, we, you know, through this process of opening Seventh West, we created a, like an incubation, a business incubation for uh, local small businesses. And, you know, we have GP Guy uh, in our kitchen as well as uh, Maserat. And, you know, they were operating our kitchen and, you know, them being more of a pop-up, it was a, a lot more difficult for them to, to really operate, especially in a brick and mortar situation. Um, and so we lost our, our kitchen operator, and so we had to pivot. Um, thankfully, I have really good partners, uh, Kevin Pogone and uh, Pancho Kachingwe, that, you know, we just kind of hunkered down and, you know, really uh, got together, figured out a menu, and tried to, uh, you know, do a distribution of labor. Um, but our main priority when we shut down was to ensure that our staff, um, you know, had some needs. You know, we provided uh, staff meals from day one. Uh, since um, COVID hit, just so that our staff wouldn't um, would have something uh, throughout the week. Um, so we prepared meals. Actually, Kevin prepared meals, um, and you know we, uh, with our um, with our business, um, you know we are primarily a venue. We're known for being a venue. You know we went from throwing 500 to 1,000 person large scale events to not doing anything because we didn't really have a more traditional restaurant operation like Mestiza or Little Skillet um, or even, or even Baon. And so um, we had to pivot pretty immensely to do more of a uh, restaurant style uh, dining operation. Um, so, you know, with revenue dropping substantially, it was really difficult to kind of pivot because all of the models had to change for us completely. Um, yeah, you know, with, with you know, harkening back to what uh, Deanna said is, you know, just, just one roadblock after another after another um, with the fires. And, you know, we've been really adamant about the health and safety of not only our staff and ourselves, but our patrons and not really wanting to take those types of, of risks and extending ourselves so much so that, um, you know, we basically are closing when AQI was at a hundred or if it was, you know, just unhealthy because we didn't want to encourage people to come out. We're already in a pandemic that is, you know, respiratory related um, illness. And so we didn't really want to encourage folks to come out and, you know, potentially put themselves at additional harm. Um, so yeah, it, it's, you know, very similar, very similar stories, just kind of a different format in which we had to, you know, adjust and pivot and, and make some changes. And, you know, my, my big focus was to ensure that with this new processes that we kind of onboarded, um, that we also have hardcore COVID safety protocols. Um, you know, we are fortunate enough that we have a large outdoor space where we can uh, accommodate a great number of people. We just aren't really necessarily pushing that because uh, it's just, you know, it's not safe. And, um, but, you know, at the same time, um, you know, generating revenue is also really important. Um, so, you know, we're coming up with, constantly coming up with different uh, alternatives. We're gonna be opening up a market soon. 
um, you know, hosting, starting to slowly but surely host more events, obviously with, you know, proper social distancing and, um, but yeah, it's, it has been a challenge and I commend everybody that is on this uh, panel right now for making those changes and those moves. It's been hard and, you know, we have a, a solid team and the support of our community has been immense. Um, and a lot of our regulars have been there with us and, you know, like sticking it out with us. And we're just, we're just happy to be kind of at this position where, you know, we can relatively be somewhat sustainable. That's really, really good news. Um, hear, hearing all of these, these struggles just makes me think how much we took for granted when this wasn't happening. We go to a restaurant, spend two or three hours there, have a great time. We forget that there's 10, 15 people that have been there since what, 10 a.m., 9 a.m., 5 a.m. if you're doing breakfast or, the, or overnight, just so that you can have the, that couple of hours of experience. And then now this is completely transforming what a restaurant experience uh, even is. Um, but therein lies, I think, a lot of the opportunity. Uh, there's a number of maneuvers that I picked up just in the conversation. A big one was just opportunities with your leases, lease negotiation, moving to a new location that has more advantageous cost uh, structure. Um, uh, takeout and delivery, of course, that's a natural one. Uh, meal kits. Um, I'm definitely curious as to how meal kits have been uh, helpful or hurtful. Um, what are customers' kind of expectations around meal kits? Uh, we also talked a little bit about um, selling alcohol in different ways. Uh, even, uh, Harold, you you are uh, doing some on-camera talent for Bon Appetit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, when the, the the situation happened with Bon Appetit maybe a few months back with the racism and the brown face and all that kind of stuff, you know, I'm from the South Bronx, so uh, I just took it as an opportunity to kind of, you know, go into the paint real quick and play, you know, play with the big boys, you know. So I just reached out to one of the producers and and said, you know, my community work that I do in, the, in New York and uh, the work that I do uh, with the, the culinary world, I think you're going to need my talent to – to bring back what Bon Appetit's uh, stature was a few years ago. And, and then I just went through the, the motions and then I got hired. And I think, you know, the best part about it is there's three Filipinos on the team. You know, there's Mel from uh, Seattle, um, who's a good friend of mine. And then Tia, who's half Filipino from uh, Los Angeles. So I think, you know, representation with the flags up top is really about, you know, um, putting Filipino food up front and using the platform to create the narrative about what it looks like to change the industry from the inside out in a sense where minority owners or minority chefs have a chance to, to get on a platform to speak their truth and be able to, uh, you know, to get some more light and, and be able to, you know, get some of these James Beard, James Beard awards, you know what I mean? That, that's a really fascinating point. Um, and and there's, a, there's a really controversial article that I think was in the New Yorker um, forget the author, but the title was Let the Restaurant Industry Die. Mm. I believe it was published in April or May. The main point that I picked up out of it was that the restaurant industry in its current form is kind of the, the tip of the spear when it comes to gentrification. That's right. And, and this, this um, and everyone has a different kind of meaning of what gentrification is, but basically the displacement of people that were local to the neighborhood yeah. yep. tend to be people of color, right? Yep. So. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, check out that article. It's really fascinating. And um, speaking of changing the industry from the inside out, you know, maybe maybe we have to do some damage uh, to in order to really renovate, right? Um, that type of experimentation, though, that takes a lot of energy. So uh, Deanna, you, you've been experimenting a lot with mm -hmm. um, with your with little skillet and mestiza. Um, what are some of the more unique insights? Uh, or challenges that you overcame that, that you can share with us? Uh, the challenges. Um, you know, I think I think the challenging, one of the things is really just trying to, again, be deliberate about the choices. Um, in, the, in the beginning, when you're trying to just find opportunity uh, to keep that revenue going, uh, you make a lot of hasty decisions and those decisions may not always be lucrative. They might not be the best decisions. And it's, it's like you're throwing 
pasta at the wall and just seeing what sticks. And it can be terribly exhausting on top of everything else. Um, you know, your homeschooling, distance learning, the the racial tensions, the the fires, the everything, the everything. <laughs> it's just exhausting. So uh, almost by default, I had to really just slow down, um, scale, uh, just really focus on one business, which Little Skillet was built on a takeout delivery model. So that was fortunate for me that I didn't really have to do much like that. That was the one business that really just kept things going. Um, with Mestiza, you know, where we had other um, business um, circumstances that were happening at that location with the lease running up, um, new tenants trying to move in. Um, so that the decision to close that completely to the public seemed like the best decision at the time. Um, Victory Hall with a bar, you know, again, like these hard, these tough, really tough business decisions. I have a business partner um, where both of us had very opposing views on, on how to pivot and what to do. So that was a struggle in itself when you're when you're dealing with other partners and having to uh, be respectful of different viewpoints, different perspectives, maybe different um, goals in your per personal and professional career uh, and how that plays um, into making these big decisions. So uh, at every step, you know, the, it's just been challenging. Um, and I think like having to, to maintain some kind of um, stability um, in order to make sound decisions was maybe the the hardest thing. <laughs> uh, keeping a sense of humor has always been really important and uh, surrounding yourself with very supportive people, um, including even some of these panelists, you know, like having having um, other folks in the industry collaborate, come together, share ideas. I think that has been super useful and super helpful in just getting through this period. And, you know, this may, this may still go on for another six months, year, who knows. So having that community has been, um, I think, the the best thing. I think it's really bonded us all together and 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 eased the pain of this time. Look, that's really fascinating. Um, you know, community does give us that stability, um, and it's mm -hmm. remarkable that you link it to making better business decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs, not just in the restaurant industry, miss that point that mm -hmm. the that your own stability is actually pretty key in maintaining a realistic objective outlook and it can help you make much better business decisions. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I want to turn the question a little bit to um, kind of what the future uh, holds. Um, and I want to start with uh, AC and, and then let's go with uh, Donna. So AC, you're going to be opening up uh, soon at some point, How, how's that all going? <laughs> um, I get this question a lot. So we had a fire in August and uh, it, from the outside of the building, it looks fine, but the inside is completely wrecked. Um, like structure damage, um, basically almost everything that was inside of the restaurant like is no longer usable, my equipment, um, you know, tables, chairs, all that stuff, a lot of fire damage. So. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to be reopening in that place, um, whether we're going to be reopening somewhere else. Um, but the, if I were to reopen in that space, it would be at the earliest spring. They had to completely gut and rebuild the building, and that's no longer my responsibility as the landlord. Um, so, you know, um, I don't really have um, a set future. Everything's kind of just... Uh, just very nebulous right now. So my goal right now um, is we were doing a community kitchen still. And then yesterday actually was the last community kitchen because after the fire, we were still feeding the families that we were, we were still feeding like 500 meals a week, um, just out of my driveway, out of other places, just wanted to make sure that the community was still being served. Um, but I've decided that I need to take a personal break and I'm not really going to be, um, we're going to be the, we're going to be on hiatus until next year. Um, and, um, I guess for our future, like, I don't know. I mean, the out, everything's been changing so quickly. Like the NSA is like just roadblock after roadblock. And it's just like, it's like, you're constantly dodging something. And, um, you know, between today and what it's going to look like in January or what it's going to look like in March or April when I might reopen, like, but it's going to be 
so different than what I think it might be. Um, so I'm not really trying to put any, uh, not trying to say anything definitely or even make plans. So not until next year at least. So that's that's where we're at with a double community kitchen. I think that's solid advice. Um, and I'm glad you're taking a break. You, you definitely, definitely do love it. Yeah. Um, Donna, uh, I know you've got some background in commercial real estate and finance. Uh, Uncle Harold had uh, had mentioned previously that there are a lot of opportunities in potentially in lease negotiation. Um, this may depend, of course, on your relationship with your landlord. Um, but maybe maybe the two of you can give us some more insights on how uh, people that are in any position, especially ACs, where potentially a new a, a new facility, a uh, new lease is in the works. What should they be out for right now? Yeah. Um, well. So there's obviously there's a lot, going to be a lot of vacancies that are on board. There's going to be a lot of uh, locations that already have uh, turnkey operations. Um, something for maybe a new um, entrepreneur that's looking to to kind of break in is to find those locations that are that have unfortunately previous restaurateurs have unfortunately abandoned. Um, I know that sounds like a harsh word, but it is. You know, sometimes you just gotta you know take those sunk costs and leave them there because it's just, it costs too much money to relocate or even try to sell or get rid of. So looking for those opportunities where there was a previously held restaurant where maybe you could, you know, I'm seeing things like people are picking up uh, the liquor licenses that are attached mm -hmm. to those locations. I'm yep. seeing that they are taking over leases with, you know, substantial, uh, substantial discounts and some carve outs for, mm -hmm. um, and right now is a really great time that where landlords, you know, are really just looking for a tenant. And if you have yep. some type of, you know, background that shows that, you know, you were able to operate mm -hmm. and, you know, the circumstances and the situations of the times that you, you know, irrespective of that, that you could still potentially, you know, operate and pivot. And they're looking for those types of opportunities and, you know, open communication and, and ensuring that, you know, like letting them know where you're at, even even getting to the point where you're letting them know, here's how much money I have, here's how much I can effectively stay here for with the current situation of my finances, but also, if I get my business up and running and sustainable, here's where I can be, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's really about communicating. And mm -hmm. we are very fortunate to have a landlord that has, um, you know, very generous to us during this time. Um, but communicating and looking for uh, leaseholds that were previous uh, restaurants, because there's a lot of opportunity there and landlords are, you know, they're, they're also kind of panicking. Um, at mm -hmm. this point, because a lot of vacancy, um, because, you know, they, they ultimately have the bank to, uh, that they're responsible for. So right. no mm -hmm. income for us means no income for them. Sure. And you know, they're willing to wheel and deal. Yeah. So, so Uncle Harold, uh, like, like how is your relationship with your, your landlord or, or other ownership? How's that evolved through all of this? How, how are you guys handling mm -hmm. all of this? So what happened uh, really was uh, some of these restaurants that's been struggling throughout the pandemic is asking for help for you know operators like myself so we would come in and and, and you know um have a conversation with the landlord create the relationship that they never had before uh give them the pathways to operate in the positive in the next six to eight months and the best part about the time right now is the landlords are willing to to give you two or three months uh, uh ti money coming in especially if it's a it's a brand new project they're willing to give you ti money up front build out the space for you and what they're really doing is carving out a space for the other person once you, you know, fill out your fulfillment on your lease and they can they can plug and play another another set of people in there. So, I mean, uh, what's happening in New York is there's a lot of buildings that were getting built uh, before uh, the pandemic and, you know, they have to finish these contracts out. So some of these buildings are empty uh, from the, the, the commercial spaces, especially for like little cafes or any of that sort that they were putting in the space as part of the amenities uh, space. So... Any entrepreneur can come in and build out uh, a, a product or a, or a, a concept into this space, build out their dream space, and then be able to you know operate for six to eight months, build out the brand, activate it, and then flip it into an e-commerce uh, business if, if they want to, and then just move on from there. I mean, the opportunity right now with the landlords and the and kind of spaces and all this kind of stuff is everywhere. I mean, I'm in the Lower East Side right now. I flip my camera. There's seven stores that are closed right now right in front of me 
and and all asking for you know intro in, uh, uh, all asking for uh, uh, intro to, to to go into the space I mean um, I mean if you if you're really if you're really up for the challenge and up for you know the little bit of pain in the beginning uh, 2021 if you build it up right now would be a good year for you to, to really pop and really create a brand to to activate and then go into 2022 looking into the positive. I do wow. want to add one thing, PJ, is that with this pandemic, you know, kind of to piggyback off of what Diana was saying earlier, is that where a lot of us have been forced to, you know, full stop, it has been a kind of a great equalizer for a lot of people. People that didn't think that they could ever become a restaurateur or an entrepreneur, now is the time because the opportunities are there. The challenges are also there and the, the, the learning curve is steep. You know, um, but it has, like I said, it has been a great equalizer and being able to, you know, if you have the gumption and you have the ability to, um, you know, hang out, hang in there and really hustle hard, like you can come up and, and now is, and now is the time. Now is the time because there's so many businesses that are, you know, for whatever reasons just can't survive. And, you know, it's an opportunity for somebody that, you know, maybe has some savings to come in and uh, do their hustle. Yeah, I mean, I think Filipinos in the bottom line are, are, are th these type of people, you know what I'm saying? Um, where we're always, you know, in the, mix, in the mix of it, you know? And I think uh, this time period right now is really, you know, an opportunity for a lot of people to come together, put their money together and, and talk about buying some, you know, buy some of these buildings, you know, buy some of these properties. We're talking about, you know, multi-million dollar spaces that are for, for, for cheap right now. So if you know if, if if people can come together and, and and put their differences to the side, and build something together, and talk about building the new Filipino Wall Street, just like you know the Black Wall Street back in the day, I mean this is this is an understanding that needs to be passed down for people in our age group. You know we're we're about to we're about to be uh, in a in, in a situation where legacy and 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 our kids are going to be affected if we don't set up shop right now to create the the foundation for what we're talking about. So, you know, I think if anybody's listening out there, you know, if you want to build, you want to come in and, and do some work, come holler at your boy. My Instagram's right here at Chef Harold. Rosa, come holler at me. I'm ready to get it in. I, I, I agree with Chef Harold. I mean, really the, the key, I think, for small business owners and getting into brick and mortar spaces is going to be ownership. And so I'm ready, Chef Harold. Where are we going to build? I'm coming to San Francisco. I'm going to be working with uh, the Brookfield Mall property on that yeah. uh, 5M joint. So right. okay. let's, let's have that. Let's have that conversation when it okay. comes. That's a I'm little done. bomb for you. Undiscovered that. You know, undiscovered that stuff. That's a little bomb for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> that is collective hustle. <laughs> so uh, I have just kind of like one last closing uh, note, and I want to start with uh, with Deanna. So, given all the opportunities that we're facing, um, that is, if you can hang in there, what what do you believe right now the federal, state, and municipal government's role needs to be in the next few months? I mean, that's a bomb question. Bro. That's I know. A, that's a grenade. Um, how do I answer this? <laughs> you know, the future, the future is so uncertain right now. And I think a lot of us are just waiting for this election to happen. Uh, really, the outcome of the election is going to determine a lot about how business owners um, are going to carry their ideas forward. And, you know, with that is even with the pandemic response and, and the leadership and how we're going to treat this pandemic and get through the fall and get through the winter and how we're gonna treat the recovery for small business is so important. Um, the federal, I mean, you know, we're waiting, what is this? You know, we're, we've been waiting for so long. We need another round of PPP. Yes. Um, we, we need that yesterday. Um, I think October, November are gonna be a really, really critical month for a lot of small businesses. We're gonna see probably, you know, 30% increase in uh, 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 bis small businesses, not just uh, restaurants, but a lot of a lot of small businesses folding um, just because it doesn't make economic sense anymore. Uh, so yeah, fed at, at the top level, I mean, the federal government, federal government needs to put in a lot more work and a lot more effort to help its small business owners. Yes. I mean, 
we we employ such a large population. We we are responsible for the economic viability of all of our neighborhoods. Um, it's just so important. So um, at the state level as well, at the city level, um, here locally, and you know, there's some effort being made, but there could be a lot more done in, in the way of helping on, on a local level. Um, I think really for the future, that collaboration and create creativity, uh, especially in this industry, is going to be vital. Um, rethinking about how we do business and, and the sustainability of it. Um, we're going to need to interact and engage a lot more with different industries. Um, yep. Some blending of retail, special mm -hmm. events, yep. entertainment. Um, yep. We need to we need to uh, collaborate with these industries to, to really help each other and, and push these ideas forward. Um, even in, in the way of ownership, you know, I like Chef Harold's idea of like owning, having ownership in buildings. Like that's really how you're going to ensure that the longevity of your business and not being beholden to landlords and um, having landlords profit off of your sweat equity. Um, I'd like to see more of a model in restaurants going to worker owned, employee owned, co-op models, yes. um, profit okay. sharing. Yes. Um, um, you know, like I just can't express uh, the gratitude that I have for my staff that has just really mm -hmm. stuck it out with me and been there for years with me and just, they just work so hard and they, and mm -hmm. they do it for very little and very little gratitude. So I love, I'd love to share um, you, any success that I have along with mm -hmm. mine. That's right. That's right. That's the way to do it. I mean, piggybacking off the, the, the what she what Diana just said. There's a there's a restaurant group in Philadelphia called South Philly Barbacoa. It's uh they were on Chef's Table, and the chef's name was Christina Martinez, and they're working on a model now with a bunch of lawyers, uh, right with the CSA co-op model where uh, people that are uh, immigrants and people that are uh, in the restaurant industry that don't have any papers they can buy into the into the project by just creating sweat equity. And uh, the the one person that gets salary is obviously the one the, the alpha on top, whoever mm -hmm. he or she is. But everybody else gets a chance to co-own the space and then be able to say that they're restaurant owners and then use that to leverage to open other places and stuff like that. So there's yeah. been uh, there's been a lot of conversations in the industry, especially internationally. You know, from New Delhi to to France to uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. There's been really a lot of conversations about these models, uh, especially with the Escoffier system being such a hindrance on kind of the progression of mental health, progression of, of, of chefs and color overall. You know, the Escoffier system was built out of Fordism and Taylorism, and they were built because uh, they wanted to create food that was perfect every time and everybody could have it at the same time, right? But that model is already archaic, especially in the socialistic, uh, in the approach that's happening now with Black Lives Matter, and all these kind of things. So we have to really understand the fact now is how do we create uh, a space for our uh, workers or anybody that want to come in that they feel like they have accountability in the space and then they have some kind of equity into the into the business. And then on the kickback, two years later, they stay with us. They can get 2% off the top of the profit and then and then we can have that conversation and, and, be, and make them uh, aware of the profits and losses and all that kind of things. But you know, you're right. The industry needs to change now. And the moment is now because once the election happens, we're going to be stuck with whatever we, you know, we, we gets voted in. And then we won't be able to make that change. And the window of opportunity is closing for sure. Mm -hmm. That is very, very well said, Uncle Harold. Thank you so much. Um, we actually are out of time for our panel today. Um, I want to thank each and every one of our panelists for joining us. Um, Uncle Harold from New York. Thank you. Um, Chef AC, where are you calling in from? I'm in Long Beach right now. In Long Beach, thank Long you, Beach. representing SoCal. Uh, <laughs> Donna in Oakland, thank you very much. And Deanna in the city by the bay, thank you very, very much to everybody. Um, and you know, I think one of the biggest takeaways here is be mindful, find a way to own something, and get through it because there's light at the end of the tunnel. Stay strong. Thank you, everyone, for participating and join the networking area and keep the conversation going.